Flowers are sprouting. Birds fly from their nests. Ships fare north, fare south as well. Roads lie open when you rise. The fish in the river dart before you. Your rays are in the midst of the sea. The entire land sets out to work. In the Trobrian Islands, fishermen lure fish to their nets with a song. Every sunrise, from the great urban centers like New York and Tokyo, to tiny hamlets in the highlands of New Guinea, to jungle villages in Venezuela, men and women go to work. From their labor springs the great cycle of economic behavior that makes every monument, every book, every culture possible. Production, distribution, and consumption. These are the central components of that cycle. Anthropologists consider forms of distribution the essence of economic behavior. Forms they label reciprocity, redistribution, and market exchange. For the Kung Bushmen of the Kalahari Desert in Botswana, the world is infused with spirit and every hunt carries with it a burden of reverence and ritual. The Kung are one of the last groups to maintain the hunting and gathering life until 10,000 years ago, the universal mode of human organization. The Bushmen must live according to the rhythms of nature and must share every bit of food to survive. Theirs is an economic system based on generalized reciprocity, the unrestricted distribution of all food and resources to every member of the band. My friend, the way it is with us Bushmen is that we love meat. When we hunt, we always search for the fat ones, the ones dripping with layers of white fat, fat that slides down your gullet and fills your stomach. The Bushmen rarely have more than two or three days' supply of food on hand, mostly mongongo nuts. And the meat collected from the kill is a luxury to be enjoyed by all. The successful hunters of the day may spend up to two hours arranging piles of meat so that everyone gets a fair share. To us, their world may seem a harsh round of desert and heat. In fact, the Bushmen live and eat well. Though they possess nothing we would call wealth, they are rich with the spirit of nature and exist with it as one. Up the Mavaca and Orinoco rivers, in the steaming jungles of southern Venezuela, live the Yanomamo, who call themselves the Fierce People. Unlike the Bushmen, they stay in one place to cultivate their gardens and hold on to things, if only a few. Tobacco, hammocks, dogs, arrows, bananas. These are treasured objects. Usually at war with other villages, the Yanomamo are preparing to exchange these items at a great feast as part of a ritual involving balanced reciprocity or the giving of equivalent gifts. An alliance will be struck between Mishi Mishi Maboa Teddy and Patanoa Teddy. The visitors drink a soup made of boiled plantains and then present themselves in full battle dress before the feast begins.
The Yanomamo cries strength and fierceness. Both are evident at the ritual dancing that precedes the serious business of cementing an alliance through an exchange of gifts. At the feast, the hosts must give whatever their visitors request, but fear that the visitors will not reciprocate at a later time with a gift of equal value. The fear, of course, is that negative reciprocity will occur, an unequal return for a prized possession. Highly charged exchanges like these are of great interest to anthropologists who consider such rituals a form of distribution of goods fundamental to many non-Western economic systems. Here, generosity is a great virtue, and the Yanomamo believe that the only sure way to hell is through stinginess. No gift exchange is more elaborate than the Kula trade practiced by the Trobrian Islanders who occupy the South Sea Islands off the eastern tip of New Guinea. This exchange is again based on balanced reciprocity. Called by many the Argonauts of the Western Pacific, members of the trade undertake epic voyages over hundreds of miles to exchange Mwali and Bagi the precious Kula ornaments. Always traveling, always changing hands, Kula pieces belong to one person for a time and then must be passed on. Each Kula piece has its own name and its own history. Its value is based on who has owned it, who has wooed and persuaded others to part with it through magical spells and competitive negotiations. The object increases in worth as it moves from island to island. Trading partners should repay each other with gifts of equal value, but no one can be forced to do so. Here the richer a man is, the more he must give through the ceremonial use of wealth. For the Mendi in the nearby highlands of New Guinea, exchanging wealth to gain prestige seems to have become an obsession. Every aspect of life for this Neolithic culture is permeated by economic activities involving both reciprocity and a redistribution of wealth. And any Western entrepreneur might envy their prowess in managing such affairs. <laughs> Marriage calls for serious economic negotiations amongst the Mendi. Though they have never seen the sea, their main currency is the crescent-shaped gold-lipped pearl shell traded up from the coast. Each one is worth, in our terms, about $35. A bride price has been arrived at after much haggling. Now the bride pays the first installment to her relatives, giving shells to a favorite brother, or snubbing an uncle who has not paid her enough attention. She creates obligations through these gifts, and she may well need the credit, since divorce is so common among the Mendi. Women are virtually powerless in Mendi society, however, 
and most giveaways of wealth involve masculine prerogatives. The pig kill is a great event in the life of the Mendy and is part of a complex protocol of debt and staggered repayment to cement personal and clan alliances. However, it's a sad day for the women who have tended these pigs as pets and even lived in the same house with them. And now their pets are taken and eaten after the giant pig kill. Before the kill, the head of the clan, the big man, decides each portion of the meat to be distributed, giving away the meat what anthropologists call a redistribution of wealth, will set up another round of obligations. The job of handing out the meat is a tricky one, and disputes often arise. Here, the big man is the big giver. The more pigs he has contributed to the kill, the more prestige he has. The best way to save wealth in this horticulturist society is to store it inside a pig, and thus each one represents the surplus from a fertile garden. By far, the biggest giveaway of wealth for the Mendy is the cassowary contest, which can take years to arrange. The cassowary contest is a form of complete financial disarmament. In order to buy 50 cassowaries, which cost about $450 each, the clan has called in loans and foreclosed on debtors, and then, in essence, they give away all their wealth to make peace with a rival clan. Inter-clan warfare was once common, but now they battle with wealth going into voluntary bankruptcy and strangling the cassowary. Later, they will eat the stringy meat and use the feathers for headdresses. Next week, the guest clan will kill all the cassowaries they have managed to buy. A classic example of what anthropologists call an economic leveling device. This practice prevents any one man from becoming too wealthy because he has to give it all away. What he gains is prestige. A culture like that of the Mendy reveals just how elaborate and sophisticated a wholly non-Western economic system can be. Unlike the Mendi, these nomads of Afghanistan must deal with aspects of both a Western and a non-Western economy. Where once Alexander the Great and Genghis Khan spread their beliefs by fire and the sword, more recent invaders have brought Western economic systems, both communist and capitalist, to transform the trading practices of a traditionally pastoralist culture. Maldar moved from the Turkestan plains of Afghanistan to the high grasslands in order to feed their sheep and their goats. Separated by vast distances, the nomads carry out all important business exchanges at the market, which is the very heart of many non-Western economies. Markets come into being when people do not raise all that they need and must trade a lamb or a goat for the wheat produced by others. A place to gossip, to learn the news, 
The market works because of the word of individuals who make and control the sale of their own goods. Even before Westerners arrived here, money was a major medium of exchange. Money can more easily stand for an agreed-upon value, more easily than a goat or a pig. It can also be transported or divided up more easily. The parents of these youngsters are paid by the hour for their work as the girls practice the ancient art of carpet weaving. Once the Western world discovers goods for which it will pay cash, the market expands to become not just a place, but an abstraction. These carpets increase in value as the point of exchange moves from the localized, the known, the traditional, to the vast impersonal world market based on exchange values that fluctuate with supply and demand. The local market and the world market are separated by vast cultural differences in perception and in value. Modern industrialization has brought wealth to some countries that were once tribal and non-Western. But the wealth is now unequally distributed. What people once did, machines do now. And the very nature of labor changes as it becomes part of the production process. Goods are made in pieces, and people sometimes never see the finished products of their own hands. The most powerful spirits to subdue in the world of the machine are those of boredom and alienation. In segregated South Africa, where the ownership of resources is concentrated in the hands of a small white minority, alienation takes on an even more profound meaning. People who once shared all with grandparents and children experience the new world of wage labor as cruel and barren. Separated not only from the fruits of their work, Families are separated from each other as well. Workers become mere units of labor, forced to live where the government chooses, whether in black ghettos surrounding the white cities or in barracks with locked gates. Carol Mokoena has lived here for four years in order to support her family. She needs a permit to live and work in the city, and in some ways she lives like a prisoner. I'm not feeling very well when I'm just living in the hostel. Because I'm not living with my children. It would be very nice to me if I was staying with my children. So we are not allowed here to stay with our children here. And we are not allowed to tell our children that they can come and visit for us. If they come to visit for us, they are supposed to stay outside the gate. We go to the gate and see them. So it's very hard to me when I'm a woman, when your children come and stay outside the gate. For many in the world, economies based on cash and wage labor bring confusion and grief even tragedy. The nature of capitalism and communism seems to strip the world of its sacred character, and work and the family may become fragments of a shattered existence. This is especially painful for those who once knew trees as friends and the spirit of nature as a god. The record was set by blue chip stocks, the Dow Jones Industrials, but the advance today was across the board, big companies and small, on the New York Stock Exchange, the American Exchange, over the counter. Modern capitalism and communism have been successful in creating the notion of economics as a realm apart from the spiritual and familial. 
As gold prices fell by the minute toward their biggest one-day drop in two years... Most Nevertheless, our economic system is embedded in a complicated, powerful structure of beliefs, based in part on the Protestant work ethic. In the Western world, as R. H. Taney once wrote, the attainment of riches is treated with reverence and is viewed as the supreme happiness. Prices for the sharp drop in gold. We tend to equate our personal worth with how much cash we receive for our labor. Yeah, that's fine. We sell our work even within the family. Yeah, you got to very good. Sit down there. You really think you're worth two bucks an hour? I think you deserve about a buck. I think that's what I deserve, John. Uh, a buck fifty? Yeah. He deserves a buck ninety-nine. I'll pay a dollar seventy-five, and then you can pay Marie. Okay. Marie gives a quarter from each of those. For each of what? For each of my hours. Whatever. You have a dollar bill? Yeah. Can you three weeks? Is that right or not? Three weeks? No, I only have three weeks. You were getting paid while she was. Give me a dollar bill back, please. Three times three is nine. I want a dollar back. We place such a high value on wealth in this country that we may be tempted to think rich people somehow better than poor people, that the wealthy deserve their riches and the poor their poverty. Our economic behavior would no doubt astound a Yanomamo or someone from the Trobriand Islands. But they would surely understand the ritual of exchanging gifts at Christmas time. They would probably see our personal quest for balanced reciprocity as somewhat less intensely symbolic than their own. Primarily because our gifts are not used to create trading partners for our clan. The Mendy are no strangers, however, to the rituals of conspicuous consumption a term Thorsten Veblen used to describe the display of wealth for social prestige. In non-Western cultures, conspicuous consumption usually means giving everything away in order to achieve prestige. Here we accumulate more than we give away. Achievement lies not in giving, but in getting. Capitalism is not necessarily a more developed economic system, but it is one of the most complicated and the most powerful. For a time in the world, some forced themselves ahead and some are left behind. For a time in the world, some make a great noise and some are held silent. For a time in the world, some are puffed fat, and some are kept hungry. So wrote the Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu in the 7th century B.C. All economies would vanish were it not for men and women of the world, their labor and their spirit. Without them, fields would go unplanted, the harvest would rot, and the society we know would cease to function. As the great Chinese sages wrote in the Book of Changes, the well is there for all. No one is forbidden to take water from it. 
No matter how many come, all find what they need. But a well is dependable. It has a spring and never runs dry. Therefore, it is a great blessing to the whole land. 